So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Pablo Paredes. Uh, Pablo is a clinical assistant professor in the Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Department, as well as the Epidemi and Epidemiology and Population Health Departments at Stanford School of Medicine, where he leads the Pervasive Wellbeing Technology Lab. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc in the CS department at Stanford, and before that, got his PhD in CS from Berkeley. Uh, before grad school, he had a very interesting career as a strategic manager with Intel in Brazil, a product manager with Telefonica in Ecuador, and he was an entrepreneur also in Ecuador. He's had many papers in the top HCI conferences, such as CHI, CSCW, et cetera, et cetera, and also has numerous publications in mixed medical CS venues, like the Journal of Medical Internet Research. He's the PI or co-PI of numerous grants, bringing in way more money than me. Uh, including being the PI of a new NSF uh, Sensi Award, Multimodal Sensor Systems for Precision Health Enabled by Data Harnessing, Artificial Intelligence, and Learning. So as you can see, he has an excellent record and has done lots of stuff, and we are excited to have him here. So Pablo, take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, well, uh, I'm here. My name is Pablo Paredes. Thanks for having me uh, today. Uh, I'm here uh, presenting the pervasive well-being technology conversation about sensors and intervention related related to sensor management. So, growing up in Ecuador uh, was actually uh, quite uh, enjoy and joyful. And one of those highlights was uh, uh, sharing time with my brother, who's actually playing the drums in the background. I'm playing the the, the keyboards, as you can see, and you know, it was it was really nice. You know, it's a great place. But you know, one of the hard parts of like uh, my life was like he uh, he developed an anxiety disorder called obsessive compulsive disorder very early in his life, and sadly it took many many years for him to to get a proper diagnosis and actually to to get in, uh, improved. And and this is one of those things that get exacerbated with like. Uh, several things, but especially with stress, one of these um, is a tremendous risk factor for this kind of anxiety disorder. So uh, one of the things I had an opportunity to do and one of the inspirations was working for uh, uh, when he, I brought him to, to the US to do a cognitive behavioral therapy treatment because there was nothing like that in Ecuador with the only Spanish speaking uh, therapies that I found and uh, he asked me, she asked me to basically like set up his phone to remind him to do things and remind him to do therapeutic things. But another thing that I found out is that he was actually spending a lot of time playing this little, this game soccer, soccer league in his like old uh, Nokia phone. And, and I asked him why and he said, well, this actually uh, helps me like, you know, reduce my anxiety, my stress playing this like very simple pixelated game. So I said, wait a minute, that's very interesting. Like, you know, so you're playing a game actually helps reducing stress. So that was one of the beginnings for me to like uh, wonder what else can we do with technology? And, you know, ever since I've been trying to like explore this topic of, of mental health for, for, for many years. And uh, at, at one point I basically quit my business career uh, and I dedicated myself to investigate this idea of proactive mental health systems and how to like avoid this story from repeating again, you know, many, many years without treatment and the right uh, type of support. And ultimately has led me to uh, try to investigate the underlying factors of mental health and, and health in general, which is stress management and well being. And I chose uh, human computer interaction as, after much deliberation, even though I'm an electronics engineer, because I found it was in the intersection between you know, the human aspects of, of the complexity of this kind of disorders and the complexity of, of anxiety and also the ability to build new things, new systems and new interfaces and algorithms. And this is the tenor of the type of work that I do and that you will be hearing throughout this conversation. Combination of the human aspect and how those inform the way that we create new technology, um, you know, uh, uh, innovative, innovation in technology. So one of the important things about stress that was really striking and it's continues to be striking to me is that there's really no good infrastructure for stress management. There's a lot of like, uh, you know, issues with stress and how this affects human life and, and many people require support, but very few people actually receive the type of support that they need. And there's really nothing embedded in the environment that can help us do it or like new technologies that really do. 
even though lately in the past, you know, maybe a couple of years, there is more investment in mental health technology, it still is like not, not close enough to what we need. But the stress is actually something that we, we all need and, and animals use really well. I mean, if you look at the zebra, uh, you know, my, my colleague, uh, Robert Sapolsky, a famous biologist from Stanford, whom I met a couple of times and had beautiful conversations. He basically says, you know, zebras use it really well because they actually know how to uh, uh, spend the effort that, you know, stress demands, which is like doing exercise and, and, uh, uh, and, and basically releasing the type of like um, substances that, that help regulate stress. Um, this this uh, relationship between the performance needed to, to, uh, to basically get out of trouble uh, and the arousal has been studied by Yerkes at Dodson quite, quite a bit, you know, basically st stipulating that, you know, you need the right level of stress. It's really an optimization problem here, like not too little or too much stress is not ideal. And at the same time, you have uh, the perspective from McEwen's uh, um, studies, which basically define this notion of allostatic load, which is how to keep in balance all the functions of the body and how stress kicks that balance in order to basically keep, keep us going. And that's natural and normal, but if you don't have the uh, opportunity to recover from stress, it will accumulate and potentially do damage to you. However, one important thing of the zebra is that it needs a prairie to, to, run, uh, to basically do these things. Like without a prairie, the, the, the zebra will not be able to like survive from stress. It is fundamental that there is some infrastructure and without, with, without a prairie, maybe like, you know, the lion will come and the and the zebra might die out of a heart attack instead of like dying out of like, uh, you know, on the feet of the lion. But this is our prairie. Look at our modern prairie. This is where we spend 93% of our time. And this is what's filled up with stressors and the modern stressors for humans are actually about perceived things, our psychological perceived demands, perceived threats that we basically, you know, receive an email or a phone call and our body reacts the same way than the zebra, but we have no way to run. And we're just sitting there, as I say, you know, you wanna find a human, find a chair essentially, right? So this is our modern environment. To me, how, uh, the question is, how do we st do a stress management in this modern wire, right? How do we create the right type of science to do that? And to me, it's been a quest of like finding and defining the sensors and the interventions uh, interventions meaning like behavioral like manipulations that will help us basically deal with this complexity in our modern um, you know uh, environment so you know i've been asking questions like what if we can repurpose the internet uh, and make it into things that you know that work for our stress uh, advantage or what if we can like repurpose chatbots which are essentially you know quick conversations for us to recover uh, you know, also from a stress at the right moment. Or what if we have like this, this woman uh, here who is talking to the car, really conversations with, uh, with a car that will basically tell you during the commute that you, uh, the things that you need to recover. Or what if we can get your car to even like guide you to uh, manage the stress by having some haptic interface that will allow you to uh, lower your breathing rate or even better in the future, maybe embed the uh, other types of more advanced haptic uh, interfaces to basically help you regulate stress directly without, your, uh, without you paying attention. Or for example, what if a desk, you know, will be able to basically make you move like automatically without necessarily having to ask you uh, to do it or remind you to do it, it simply automatically does it. Or what if we can create these tiny robots that look like, you know, exactly like you know non-anthropomorphic that basically will touch you and give you emotional feedback for you to like feel a less stress over time what if you could also like not just uh, do all these interventions but also sense the ability to to understand what that you're stressed just by the way you move your mouse or your trackpad or your steering wheel uh like in this case you know just by the way you drive could we actually detect uh stress it's it's a bunch of questions that I've been very interested in. You know, this is basically a tenor of the conversation of the type of research that I do, which is the multi-domain and multi-model sensors and interventions through multiple domains across the workplace, uh, where I publish several uh, work, uh, also in, during the commute uh, and especially in cars and even work that I've done in, in urban spaces and, uh, and uh, throughout life in home and all the anything else that's not related to work. 
um, and all the interactions between all these. So this is basically, uh, you know, a very high level summary of the types of things that, I, that I've seen, uh, that I've done over, over the past uh, few years. Another way of also parsing the, uh, this type of uh, approximation is the, it, through the methods that I use. Um, I basically uh, work across the intersection of human uh, centered design, which is a methodology for uh, finding needs and describing new ideas, and also the scientific method in order to validate. The hope is that, you know, um, the combination of identifying needs and creativity through qualitative and exploratory work with validated hypothesis driven research will lead towards what I believe is, you know, a more engaging and efficacious uh, uh, design of systems that we can use for this kind of like uh, approaches of sensors and interventions. I also combined uh, some of my work with like machine learning in order to make things predictive. And I focus a lot also on trying to understand the implementation component of things like will these things actually be deployed in the wild. So if you if we if I can lay down, you know, the work I've done on this uh, Venn diagram, you will see that I have a pretty good balance between sensing and intervention work across uh, design uh, uh, exploration and also across validatory uh, uh, research and the intersection of both of them. And I will, I will basically be uh, walking you through some of these examples, obviously. Uh, there's no time to talk about all of this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will, I will split the rest of the talk in two parts, you know, the ongoing part, uh, the ongoing work part, and then the future research. Uh, on the first part, part one, the ongoing research, I'm going to be talking about the sensors and interventions I built. And essentially, it will be three papers that we'll be describing. One related to uh, passive sensing uh, using inter uh, inter uh, user peripherals, uh, and two uh, papers related to interventions, one uh, on suites of interventions, uh, multiple interventions, and one on, on physical interventions that I described. So let's get to the first one, uh, sensorless sensing. This is a paper from 2014 uh, about use, repurposing the, the mouse uh, as a sensor and how this led also to a paper on repurposing the steering wheel from the car, the paper. So this paper is basically inspired on the notion that stress is, uh, uh, the, the response to stress is no, the fight or flight. You might have heard this. When you get the fight or flight, essentially, the ability to, to survive from, from vertebrates. Whether you, you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, running or fighting, you need uh, some kind of strength to do that. And it's your muscles that load up. But there's a lot of other things that happen in your body too. Like your autonomic nervous system hits a signal that says, you know, uh, stop everything that's not fundamental, like uh, digestion, this type of thing. And let's put the, like your vision and all the other parts to action, and this is what psychophysiology has been measuring for the past 70 years, you know, how these changes reflect stress and emotion in the body. However, there is another system that's also very interesting, which is the somatic nervous system, which is the one that actually drives the musculoskeletal part of your body, the actual movement part. And this is what we basically wanted to explore in order to know how to do, uh, you know, um, measurement of stress. You know, of course, uh, there's a lot of interest in wearables nowadays, and I would say this is great research, and I'm definitely interested partially in this topic. And I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here. But, you know, one thing that is important to know about wearables that could potentially measure some of these things is that they also suffer from a lot of adoption issues and adherence issues from humans. People basically tend to forget to use them or just to charge them. And this is not a trivial problem. You will think it sounds trivial, but it becomes actually, from a behavioral perspective, a fundamental problem of adherence. And you don't want to have low adherence in any kind of system when you're having like, uh, when you're trying to measure over time. So if we use the movement part, though, uh, uh, we basically uh, could potentially repurpose peripherals. And this is what, what we propose. How can we create a biomechanical model to measure the somatic nervous system effect of stress by looking at the way you handle a peripheral like a mouse stress, a uh, PC mouse, right? You basically uh, observe uh, the movement of, of the hand under stress and compare that against the calm baseline and you try to observe if there's differences in the trajectory. To do that, we basically set up the experiment that, you know, it's well known for those who work in HCI that called the fit, called, called the fit slow, where we had all these different canonical movements of the mouse, pointing and clicking and steering and dragging and dropping. 
And we basically modify the different distances and widths of all these different interactions to try to capture uh, stress and uh, sorry uh, movement under two conditions: the stressor condition, which where we have applied re recursive subtraction and, and social influence, a well-known stressor from psychophysiology, and a baseline uh, will be the other condition, the baseline, which is essentially a pseudo invidia. Uh, the way that we decompose the signal was essentially by borrowing uh, a technique from speech processing called linear predictive coding, which is a simple FIR uh, inverse filtering technique that can decode the, the components of a second order mass spring damper, which is the, the representation of the, um, of the arm and the K coefficient, which is the representation of the spring can be obtained by looking at the damping frequency of that system by looking at the stable poles of that uh, system, and uh, which is essentially the imaginary part of this uh, uh, stable second order system. At the end of the day, uh, we were able to basically run this study and prove that effect effectively damping frequency went up for stress uh, for all the, the summary of all the interactions that I described before, and even more pronounced in the point and click uh, interaction, which is the most actually prevalent uh, in human uh, use of a mouse. To give you an idea, I think we click around five to 10,000 times per day. So you, you can imagine, you can get 10,000 points of data for this kind of system from your regular mouse every day from any human. It's actually interesting to observe that, you know, there was, you know, a correlation with the self report uh, differences in this study. Uh, self report of stress, you know, people rating from zero to 10 was the level of stress work uh, uh, really well uh, basically during the baseline and the applied movement oops and the applied movement of the of the arm but we saw that people noticed the difference however when we measured the uh, um, psychophysiological measurements one of them is called high rate variability which is one uh, thing that you derive from electrocardiogram we didn't observe a, a strong signal on the movement of the, uh, during the movement of the mouse, but we observe a strong signal only during the baseline, the, apply, the application of the stressor before we capture the movement of the mouse. Uh, so we will say, you know, uh, our damping frequency seems to follow closely the perceived stress uh, aspect um, in this study. Another observation that might be also of interest to you is that, you know, if you actually observed all the, the different uh, means of the different uh, uh, stress, uh, damping frequency values for stress and non-stress, we observe this very peculiar pattern of, of a correlation with, uh, with the distance of the targets uh, and, uh, and not, not so much with the, um, uh, the width of the target, which makes it very interesting to observe that, you know, with, with only the distance, you could potentially already have an estimate of stress. You don't need to worry about the, the width of the target, which makes it like, you know, somewhat privacy preserving. That means that you don't need to know the application layer to really make any type of inference in this type of thing. And even with a very simple classifier applying a, a simple, uh, you know, geometric uh, function of this uh, structure, you could already get up to 70% uh, uh, accuracy uh, training with like, you know, a few samples. In this case, we're training with uh, each, each person got 200 samples for, for each condition. So we train on the uh, remaining uh, 200 minus uh, two times 10. That means like 180 samples to train on this simple model. And that means that with 10 samples uh, from uh, the stress part and 10 samples of the count part, you will already have a approximation close to 70%. You might say, well, 70% is not too much, but in public health, it could be very useful. Like if you're trying to be proactive and trying to understand what's going on. So th that's why I think, you know, it's important to think along the lines also of public health, not only along the lines of like treatment in, in the case of this work. This, this work was also extended to the, uh, to the car. As you can see, here's like, you know, the study within the car and we actually showed that the, the uh, damping frequency for the angular displacement in this case, looking at the, at the, angle, uh, uh, at the angle of the steering wheel, which could be plus or minus 450 degrees max, was actually uh, also uh, representative of stress. And we put people under two conditions, calm and, and stress, and we measured the 
the, the this angular frequency over like you know the course of the experiment. One interesting thing about this experiment was that we had to apply not just the math as the stressor, but also heavy metal in order to keep people connected uh, with the stress for for the whole ten minutes. Uh, and of course, uh, I like heavy metal, so it might not stress me too much. But uh, but uh, we, it's well known that you know. <laughs> Uh, the uh, majority of population get like pretty stressed with uh, with the, with death metal. Finally, more recently, we we are also very proud that we're pretty much in submission right now of this paper where we prove that we can actually do it with a real car, not just with a simulator car. We actually ran a study in a garage that uh, of a new building at the med school, and we're very um, you know proud that you know we got the signal and also that we were able to put. This speed is very hard to run. It took like five months of, of running this experiment, trying to collect the information. Uh, but you know, it's there. So, anyways, in summary, you know, I told you about this mouse stress paper and how we use the mouse as the biomechanical sensor, and then how that evolved towards the steering wheel. And the insights I would say is that you know it's very interesting that there's I would say arguable more compliance because you're using the mouse all the time. You don't need to wear new things. Uh, it's affordable. It's a $5 mouse. It's just software that you need to deploy. Of course, we can argue that, you know, the deploy, deployment model, whatever, but at the end of the day, you don't need to deploy hardware. No need for hardware for these things. And finally, I don't know how many millions of these devices are already there. I think actually, there, I used to work for Intel, so I asked my friends, I think we're talking in the billions of, of mice deployed in the world. And, 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 I, and there's even another paper on a trackpad that I didn't show you because of time. So let's let's move to the next one. The next paper is called Pop Therapy, and it's about interventions, and most specifically about combining HCI and AI to do like these recommendations of interventions. So uh, the first the inspiration for this paper was very early in my career when I was just starting. Uh, I actually wanted to explore different types of interventions. Remember my brother playing soccer. I wanted to test also other little games and uh, also some like rudimentary wearable and and other types of things with SMS. And, and I basically got fascinated with the possibility of multiple ways of intervening. So when I joined uh, Stanford, uh, sorry, uh, Microsoft Research as an intern, we developed this app uh, called Pop Therapy, which is basically a combination. You can see the app working there on a Windows phone, of course, because Microsoft Research. And we were basically like, you know, able to uh, design this app to provide micro interventions whenever people request it and essentially uh, rate the stress that you can see here, rate the level of stress before and after the intervention, and then the system will provide a recommendation personalized to the person. And some, in some cases, you can override that decision and essentially decide that you don't want to play, you don't want to do social media, maybe you want to play a game, like in this case, and then eventually, like, you know, this is all recorded in training the algorithm. So we basically had three fundamental research questions. One is, can we re generate a, a micro-intervention suite with pop culture, meaning with things that you already do online, you know, to do these micro-interventions, these quenches of stress? Can we determine with machine learning the successful policy to basically provide the right intervention at the, for the right state of, you know, personal in context? And finally, can we actually see effects in the longer term you know, with this gently uh, approach, gentle approach, you know, how do we develop this ability to cope? Cope is the ability for people to learn to deal with the stress, not just to deal with stress, but the, their style of dealing with stress. And that can be measured with scales too. Actually combined, you know, the, uh, the, the system goes through like a self requested stress uh, call from the user. We compute information based on context, and I'll explain more the details, and we repurpose some things that you already do. So let's start first with the interventions, how we designed interventions. Essentially, to create this intervention, which has two parts, a little prompt that says do something, and then the link that sends you. What we did is we basically observed the most popular apps and games that we basically guarantee that we're using things that people will use. And this is not a trivial thing in the world of design. We basically are taking advantage of like millions of dollars of Facebook doing UX design, so I don't have to do it, right? And I don't have a hundred millions of dollars to work on this. But I intersect this with uh, the therapeutic techniques from psychology that works for stress. And we found things that look similar like that. For example, this intervention is similar 
to what we call the, the three good things, which is a type of intervention from uh, uh, positive psychology that actually has been proven many times to work. And this is uh, an example of, of something that you can do um, individually. Or another example here, like where we're actually trying to do get people to move more by basically asking them to laugh and also share uh, funny things with people, which is, you know, being documented in laughter. And stuff. So at the end of the day, we had 16 interventions, four different categories and two types for each category. And this is essentially the computational space. We have this context, uh, basically a lot of information from the phone and about the different traits from the human that we use to compute this uh, multi-arm bandits uh, uh, algorithm that we use for co computation uh, uh, and the decision, the decision space where the interventions that I mentioned and the reward was the difference of stress between what happened before and after the intervention so that we can follow this paradigm of exploration and exploitation, which is the basis of multi-arm bandits, right? Exploration meaning like looking for all the different interventions that might be of interest at the beginning and then those that work, we start exploiting, you know, as we increase, you know, the knowledge and the algorithm starts converging. The experiment uh, basically uh, had 95 users and it ran for four weeks. So because we wanted to see the longitudinal effects and we had essentially a two by two design where we had random assignment of interventions versus machine learning assignment of interventions and also the possibility to override or not override the, the recommendation from the system. Uh, and as you can see, this is all the information that we collected on a daily, weekly and a pre post basis. At the end of the day, we basically found out that uh, the machine learning with override um, uh, was actually very useful for people to, to, um, to learn to cope over time. And that means that, actually this is wrong, it should be the other way around, there's no override here. Um, and essentially it will basically allow people to, uh, to learn to, to be more uh, effective by coping, coping measured by the amount of constructiveness versus destructiveness of coping that you can measure with the coping uh, st styles uh, scale that, that we applied on a weekly basis. If you look more carefully about the what happened with the algorithm itself, uh, it actually converts to two very, from all the different uh, interventions that we had, it converts essentially to positive psychology and somatic interventions. And here's where qualitative research helps. It's like, why will this be the case, right? I mean, you can theorize all you want, but you can also ask people, right? And essentially what people told us is that, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very common uh, te te technique, sadly, you know, felt like homework to people. And they say, we don't wanna be doing homework. We're already very stressed. We prefer to do things that move my body or simply like, you know, positive psychology things, like, you know, thinking positively. This is easier for us in this micro format, right? In the longer format, the other things have been, uh, you know, of course, proven. A couple of other insightful things that it's uh, good to know uh, as well from these studies. You know, people who were in the override condition were actually able to, you know, select interventions in the machine learning, as you can see, condition. And over time, they started selecting less. Pay attention that the scale is definitely not zero for to one here. It's a detailed uh, part of the scale. Uh, but after two weeks of like uh, basically receiving the right interventions, they started exploring the space again by themselves, overriding. Uh, and that was actually quite confusing to us. And we, again, we, we investigated also qualitatively and they basically said, okay, fine, breathing is good for me, but it's very boring. Like, give me something else, right? Give me something else. So I've been discussing with colleagues, how do we embed novelty, like, you know, in multi-arm bandit as you know reshaping the reward for the long term this is an interesting topic that i think will was worldwide study the other thing that's also important to see is that among those people who uh, the, the drop out which we had a pretty uniform dropout across all the conditions uh some people that dropped early were the ones who were stressed and they actually uh, uh you know uh, were telling us you know i mean i i just don't have time for this but some others also told us Okay, I get it. I learned. Thank you for teaching me. I don't need more of this system. That's the end of the system. And they basically quit. Uh, so this is another important part of designing these kind of things. In some cases, you want to design a crutch as opposed to a, uh, a wheelchair, right? You don't want people to be hooked to the system that you're des designing. And the final uh, observation of this study that's important is this adverse reaction that we observe also, which was 
interesting. Your, your app stresses, stress me up. This was the most striking problem to me. And up to today, I keep thinking about this constantly. Like, my stress management app stress people up. Now that's problematic, right? Because it's doing exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. And uh, you know, qualitatively, what they told us is like, I have no time to deal with stress. And I know I'm stressed, but your app reminds me even more of your stress, even passively being installed in my phone reminds me of stress. So I don't want to have your app. So maybe linguistically, you know, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm very actively considering. Linguistically, we might not even need to call these things stress apps because it might actually not be the right way to go. This project also led to a uh, project in chatbots, uh, essentially very similar idea of having multiple chatbots instead of multiple things to do. And this is uh, actually something that uh, it's already in press right now in JMIR. And we created chatbots for each of the different techniques that I showed you, like, like the Sherlock bot chatbot or the Glasgow full bot. Sherlock bot uses problem solving. Glasgow full actually does positive thinking and so on and so forth. And we basically found out that, you know, people actually can uh, improve their symptoms with these chatbots too. But more strikingly, one, one thing that we did supplementary to that work in the chatbot space was that we wanted people to tell us what kind of like uh, chatbots will they use for what kind of stressors in their lifetime. And there's like several types of stressors that you can see. And we asked people to basically select, you know, I want to use this chatbot for this stressor. But then we also asked them to uh, start selecting uh, the option for humans. Uh, this was done in, in uh, you know, semi-structured interviews format. You know, what will you uh, do? How will you share your time between humans and chatbots? Um, we did it in that sequence and we were expecting that people will basically say, no, I'm going to use only humans. Ch humans are better for stress. Very surprisingly, we have this distribution which is pretty much perfect. Like people want 50% of their time to be, uh, uh, sorry, 50% of their problems to be dealt with chatbots. So I think we should be thinking about new ecosystems of chatbots and humans and not human replacement for chatbots as a great opportunity. So in summary, you know, these are chest in time intervention suites, you know, the paper pop therapy that I explained about like micro interventions and also how that led to the chatbots. And the insights from this is that oh, first, you know, it's a low barrier, you know, you can repurpose things for, from the internet. You can do personalized and contextualized type of interventions. And also you can do chest in time intervention. Uh, you know, whenever people require. Finally, the last uh, intervention uh, example that I have is more a physical implementation is about breathing in the car. Um, breathing is very important for stress management. I mean, I'm not going to go in depth here, but essentially uh, breathing uh, has been already studied in mice, has like a direct connection to the central nervous system and the pacemaking of breathing regulates uh, arousal. It also regulates, of course, your heart rate, and in turns, it regulates also your, your lungs. And all these interconnectivity of systems uh, generate changes in uh, you know, the, amount, the pace of breathing and also the pace of your heart. Actually, the variability of your heart is what matters because it's related to the pace of breathing. And this is what basically help us uh, regulate the amount of stress. So you want to have a highly variable, actually, you want to have this respiratory sinusuremia, very variable. Uh, that, that's the type of pace when you're like relaxed. When you get stressed, you start breathing very uniformly and, uh, and, and less variability appears. So what, uh, what I've been studying is like, how do we, ca how can we guide people to breathe uh, slower? Uh, slowing down the breathing rate actually helps, uh, as I showed, you know, by, by modulating the central and the autonomic nervous system. How do we go to like, uh, essentially from 12 breaths per minute to six, six breaths per minute, which is actually the best, uh, uh, the, the lowest and, and, and the most effective way of breathing. Uh, and I actually explored this very early in a study that, again, that I did when I just joined. And it was really good for those who were able to breathe at six breaths, six breaths per minute. It was great. But there were quite a few people who couldn't do it. I mean, try breathing at six breaths per minute. It's really slow. Some people actually get hyperventilated. So at the end of the day, what, what I've been exploring, what I explored in these uh, more recent papers, how do we reduce just 30% of your breathing rate from your nominal baseline, 30%, it already generates an effect on your uh, arousal or stress level. We basically investigated, can we build a system such as, you know, a chair that can guide you to breathe by basically generating different interactions that will 
signal the pace of breathing. Uh, and we also investigated other movement, but, in, but the breathing was the most interesting for humans. And we basically applied that first to the uh, car in a simulator study where we got people breathing. And as you can see, the breathing rate from this per the, of this person went from 19 to 11 or from 17 to uh, 12 here. And we were able to reduce breathing rate in the simulator. As you can see, this guy is sleeping and that's actually a side effect of, uh, of, of breathing. It, he was in the, autono in the autonomous uh, uh, driving condition in this study. So that's actually a side effect that we have to pay attention. Like you can really fall asleep by, by breathing slowly. Sorry for the noise. Uh, we replicated this study and this is the study that I'm actually uh, wanna go a bit more in depth. We, we actually created, the, built a map that we applied in a real car that basically guided people to breathe uh, at a different pace. And we created a, a, a closed circuit, a uh, different uh, study than the one that I showed you before with heavy metal. And we were basically measuring, you know, not just the ability to breathe, but also the position of the car in order to measure performance in this study. We ran a study with 24 people. Uh, uh, you know, we had an intervention condition versus a control condition that, that, that uh, to help us understand the intervention. But also we added a stressor in this study as opposed to the prior study, which only had a nominal uh, breathing rate. And uh, we had two fundamental uh, hypotheses that we want to, to, to observe if you know there is like a change in breathing rate and also in heart rate variability for this case. Uh, we validated the results. We uh, found out that we could basically get people uh, uh, driving um, and with a guided uh, intervention, uh, bring the breathing rate uh, down and eventually keep it like, you know, at a lower uh, level. And also we uh, validated this in the case of the stress uh, case, uh, in the case of a pre-stressor applied before the intervention and the intervention, we actually observe a higher reduction of, uh, of, uh, of breathing rate and, and even a, a stronger like sustained effect after the breathing rate um, uh, uh, ended. Uh, if you looked at uh, this from the arousal perspective, which is the, ultimately what we want, the stress part, we actually saw the right, um, the right um, uh, results. Uh, the, run, uh, the RMSSD signal, which is one way of measuring stress, is an HRV measurement, went up. That indicates that essentially we had higher variability and, and eventually that means that people were getting calmer. As I said, we also measured during this study we were able to measure also the position of the car. And we did this with computer vision by observing with two cameras on the sides of the car, you know, the position of the car with respect to two markings that we, we put. And essentially we showed that there were no safety incidents, no severe limb depart departures and no heartbreaks. So we basically considered that this kind of work can be saved and can we move to traffic testing. As you can see, we moved always from simulator to to traffic because we don't know what are the effects of uh, stress. So you have to go, you know, very parsimoniously in this case. So in summary, we have, you know, cyber physical interventions, a calm commute and in-car breathing um, invitation. And the, and the inside essential is that we can repurpose the space and time. We can repurpose the commute, for example, as an opportunity to, to breathe uh, slowly. Um, we can also have efficacious and engaging uh, results here because you know, this is as simple as sitting in, 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 a, in a seat and ultimately it was safe. So in summary, I walk you through three different examples of one on sensing and the mouse stress, one on interventions uh, suites that, that uh, co combine AI and HCI, and finally the cyber physical interventions at the end. So this concludes per part one. Part two is my future research agenda. So in the future research agenda, there is also three elements I wanted to discuss, and, and this is going to be a bit faster perhaps than, than the first part, you know, as you know, it's more, uh, there's some speculation as any future research agenda. One is, how can we optimize the stress at a personal level? Can we do it, you know, and I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, how can we actually uh, do like uh, shared autonomy for well-being? You know, how do we combine autonomy? And finally, how do we uh, can create this go beyond persuasion in interfaces. Like I'll explain what that means. We can do more than just being persuasive. So on the personal optimization, it's basically going back to the zebra and the Yerkes and Dodson curve. You know, we, this has been observed in mouse and this is like, you know, very nicely uh, documented. 
However, if you look at, you know, studies that have been done for humans, the, the, the models are way more complex than chess and inverse U curve. For example, nurses in the ICU uh, uh, or uh, performance in the ICU, they can you can keep throwing like, you know, problems at uh, nurses and they keep solving it. So there's no like uh, inverse uh, U curve in that case, or maybe we haven't gotten to the, to the other side of the curve. We, we cannot break nurses, let's put it that way. Uh, the opposite happens with cadets and uh, people in occupational therapy where you actually, you keep throwing like uh, uh, more uh, stress and you basically break people very quickly. So we have to study this more carefully. In order to do this, we definitely keep, uh, have to continue to, to do long-term measurement and move from like, you know, this very like sh uh, shallow way of measuring once per year to a more like, you know, aeronautics or nuclear engineering approach where you can measure, you know, the human constantly, right? As if this is like very valuable machine and basically do continuous monitoring and then be able to do pre prevention and prediction, right? Uh, so essentially, uh, this is one of the things that we're starting to explore with colleagues from chemical engineering and also from electrical engineering. And this is the Sensi uh, award that we got uh, this year, essentially, well, last year, but the month came this year. Uh, where we combine uh, biomechanical sensors with biochemical sensors, which are wearables and, and our passive sensors, and also several techniques from AI that will allow us to optimize motion artifacts, optimization of the po uh, power use, um, and also uh, understand how to optimize even the way that we capture data, uh, you know, labels for training uh, these uh, new type of techniques. Uh, so this, this is one way of like combining and creating sensing ecosystems that will allow us to get better measurements. We also have to think about being multi-domain, right? I mean, how do we go beyond just, you know, the obvious? How do we go through multiple domains like doctors or office workers or students, all of them suffering from a lot of stress that will be very interesting to document these curves, uh, you know, the Yerkes and Datsun curves for all these different uh, circumstances with highly granular data. And uh, finally, uh, we have to also discuss how to engage. I mean, the passive side, I think I made a point that, you know, you don't need a lot of engagement, but if we want to have also wearables that, for example, detect cortisol, which are created by our colleagues in bioengineering, uh, this is a great opportunity to measure the biochemical aspect of stress. The problem is that, you know, it's not easy to design these wearables because uh, we actually uh, just recently published this or submitted, sorry, this study where we combine, you know, the human preferences of wearing these skin-like sensors with uh, uh, that, uh, that's the measurements in the, on the body. And we observe that, you know, humans basically want to wear these things exactly where engineers don't want to put them. <laughs> because engineers want to measure, you know, in the hands and the head where you get a better signal. Humans want it to be occluded, you know, under the, uh, you know, clothing. And we basically created this very interesting uh, uh, where we call the wear index, uh, where we, you can combine both perspectives and generate kind of like a, a you know, uh, an effect of where will this sensor will deploy in this case, the shoulders, but you can change the weights on each of these one, uh, on each of these factors here, and you can modify that and then decide how to design this type of thing. So that's, uh, that's one approach towards including human factors onto wearables as well. The other, the other thing that we're also doing is we're combining stress and productivity finally. Like we cannot just measure stress. So we created this Chrome plugin that's basically constantly measuring the amount of like productivity that you have online. We call this the home suite office. It provides like simple interventions like pop therapy, that the project that I show you, but it also measures the amount of time that you spend on different tabs and also measures uh, some tabs that you, you yourself define as, you know, like not productive, like, you know, how much time you spend in Netflix or Facebook or all these other things. And we were able to basically provide micro interventions for both stress and productivity and collect a lot of information. And not only that, we're actually co collecting a lot of information through the browser in order to do these models of like, you know, uh, sen passive sensing, you know, from like browser clicks and scroll rates, et cetera. So as you can see, personal stress optimization basically is a data-driven approach where we can extend the works of Yerkes, Yerkes and Dotson, you know, evolve technology to advance the science of uh, stress and vice versa with the science of stress evolve technology as well with these novel ways of sensing. Uh, we have to work outside the lab. We have to go to multiple domains to really understand the complexity. And we have to really work across multiple disciplines in this, in this case. The other aspect is this well-being is shared autonomy. 
So for this perspective, I basically propose theoretically the possibility that, you know, as humans relinquish control and, you know, some kind of autonomous device takes control, you know, you could potentially eventually find, you know, a uh, use of for like let's say health or well-being by by combining for example the level of adoption or the preference that people will have uh, across autonomy you know as uh, we observe that people don't have a lot of preference for autonomic uh, systems yet you know I mean that this is going to change uh, but if you assume that the, the autonomous uh, condition for example the autonomous intervention can provide the best value with higher level of autonomy there is in reality kind of like a behavioral economics problem here like a, a demand and offer here you will find that you know you will uh, have some kind of surplus or a missed opportunity where you could potentially have more autonomy but people don't want to use it so we have to think about how to get to get that surplus and get more autonomy embedded uh, without the risk of this killing people that's the high risk that we, you can have you know the more autonomy you provide people might actually lose their ability to uh, to to work uh, across well-being so one, one concept that we're testing is this idea of non-volitional behavior change. What if we create a desk, like in this case, which essentially goes up and down? And it goes up and down at any time, uh, basically in the best optimal rhythm of movement to break sedentarism. And we wanted to investigate uh, with people, you know, what would they feel if this desk just goes up and down? Uh, we did a couple of preliminary work, one that was published uh, in HRI as a late breaking report where we basically investigated uh, the perceptions of people for this desk. And the funny, the interesting part was that, you know, when asked in the moment, uh, you know, the, this is the green line in the moment, which one you, they prefer a manual or the autonomic, uh, auto, automatic version, they didn't really have a huge difference. I mean, the mean of difference is close to zero. But when we asked them to reflect about like which desk they prefer after the experiment, they had this very strong you know, perspective of why they would prefer one or the other, right? They, had, they, they, they were two camps, like the, I want the desk to take over and people who were like, you should never do this. Why do you even do that? So we actually have extended this work and we, created, we did this vignette study where we presented different levels of automation to people. And more recently, we're submitting a paper uh, to natural human behavior where we basically show that if we investigate these different levels of automation, the preferences towards uh, different levels of automation, there's actually very interesting cultural and gender differences. In India, you have essentially a uniform distribution across different levels of automation. People are open to different levels of automation. But look at the US, the US is fascinating. Like people are not really interested for the autonomous condition. They're like, especially males, they're like, I don't want this. Actually females, sorry. And then, you know, they say like, give me some level of control. Like, give me that at least once a day, let me check. And all of a sudden the desk becomes legit, but don't just uh, make it autonomous. So how do we move towards the more autonomous uh, solution is something that we need to investigate by understanding these preferences. The other perspective of automation, of course, is the, the robot part. And, you know, we've been also like investigating a couple of ideas of what kind of metaphors should we be using for, anthrop for, for robots? Like, you know, in the chatbots case, they, people said we want ecosystems of robots. What are these robots? Should they be robots? Should they look like humans? What should they be? So we have investigated a couple of things like this one, for example, is a dog bot, we call it. The human speaks to the to the machine, but the robot only speaks in dog language. I have a lot of work on my plate. And right, and you would say, well, that's kind of silly. I'm like, it's silly if you if what you want to do is communicate, but if you want to have effective responses, it's not silly at all. It actually gets people really in a good mood very quickly. So, and this is just a simple like you know device that's a voice activated device. Like we can really have like you know this. Uh, immediate positive effects by using these kind of devices. More recently, my new uh, my new postdoc, which uh, which uh, is working on robots, is actually very interested in like what is the function of a non anthropomorphic and not so more not so morphic uh, robot that we can use also to provide uh, you know uh, emotional feedback. And we're very surprised. I mean, people just just wiggling their tails. Right, these little circle things, wiggling their tails or touching you in a way that's very gentle ha can have an effective uh, response. They don't need to have eyes or, or anything, just the right type of movement. 
So, you know, shared autonomy in, in summary is like, can we actually find the surplus of, uh, of, of that theoretical well-being? Can we, can we uh, understand the mismatch between experience and preferences? People tell you that they don't want autonomy, but in reality, they might actually do. We have to like, that's why you need to investigate both sides of the coin. And then can we explore also new metaphors, you know, of autonomy? And to conclude, the last topic is this beyond persuasion aspect. So uh, the beyond persuasion aspect, and I need to move a bit faster here, I'm, uh, I'm running late. It's essentially this idea of mixed reality. I, I have proposed that, you know, mixed reality has a missing part here, which is augmented virtuality. You know, you have augmented reality, you have augmented uh, mixed reality, but augmented virtuality is what if you can get a virtually inherent space and you enhance it with reality, as opposed to a, a real reality enhanced with virtuality. And we actually ran a study and there's prior work also done in Kai by several of my colleagues. But we ran a study where we basically got people using a VR system in a car. And we designed it such that you can actually like match the movement of the water with the turns of the car. And all of a sudden, you enhance a basically like interesting experience magically with a 10, 10 miles per hour turn. It becomes like fantastic because, you know, they feel like the water is pushing them when they are navigating. Uh, with the right VR um, system. We even measure electrodermal activity and we observe that the condition, uh, the ocean uh, and the emotion, sorry, this cannot be seen well here. The, the emotion uh, condition compared to a baseline where we have a static condition compared with a static condition was actually much better to reduce electrodermal activity. The other element of like uh, enhancing this, uh, uh, so that's the, the augmented virtuality one. But what about subconscious reality? That's the other one that we're leaving behind too. We're like we're measuring a lot of things in the conscious realm. What about subconscious? Can we actually do something about like operating at the subconscious level? I mean, if you ask a psychiatrist, they will agree that 90% of our perception is subconscious. So we've been working essentially on how to embed these uh, 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 resonators in chairs in order to generate what's called entrainment. Essentially, what we do is we entrain uh, breathing rate by getting the, the chair to breathe also as if it was a living creature and basically embrace you as if it was the mother to the child and generate the synchrony between the chair breathing rate and the, uh, the, the actual uh, human. You know, we actually, uh, you know, operate at low frequencies because this has a stronger effect on your torso and we generate these envelopes that look like breathing rate to generate the vibrating uh, signal in this low frequency transducer. And uh, we basically have been able to show, uh, you know, in very early results that, that there is a signal here. And we have even been able to lower the volume of this linear actuator, volume meaning that, you know, the perception on your torso and it still get us a, a, an interesting signal. Here's actually very preliminary data. This sadly got stopped because of the pandemic. We weren't able to continue to bring people to the lab, but essentially we can bring the breathing rate lower compared to a baseline in different sub subliminal and supraliminal conditions. So in summary, the beyond persuasive interfaces essentially is talking about like augmenting mundane experiences, you know, looking at, you know, entrainment, you know, embedding these entrainment opportunities and everyday scenarios and interfacing at the subconscious level even. So uh, the last thing I wanted to say here is like ethics is really an important aspect. And, and I think we need another hour or two hours to discuss ethics, but I'm gonna at least make a disclaimer that I've been thinking, you know, how ethics affects surveillance effects in my work. You know, we need to really uh, come together with colleagues who work on these different topics in order to do this kind of work. For example, in the central sensing, should we do computing DSP-based analysis? Uh, what about user autonomy? We're always measuring. Do we need one single consent or do we need ongoing consent? Right. I, I will argue that we need ongoing consent. You cannot just have one like Facebook, okay, you sign this and that you, so, you sold your, your soul to the devil, right? Forever and ever. It shouldn't work like that, right? And finally, private, uh, malicious use, right? Nothing prevents from this being used for malicious use. So we should come together to democratize data and code to basically attend this, uh, the, uh, the, this potential uh, issue of malicious use, at least to diagnose these kind of events. So this summarizes the future research agenda, you know, personal optimization, well-being, shared autonomy, and persuasive interfaces. 
to advance automation interaction and ethics uh, knowledge through a stress of well-being. So summarizing, I show you that I can build across different domains and different like, you know, sensing and interventions. I've shown you that I can uh, repurpose design thinking scientific method and combine it with other techniques from computing to improve engagement and efficacy. I walk you through the ongoing work, all the three topics of sensing and interventions. I walk you through the future research agenda, which talks about optimization auto uh, of stress, autonomy, and pers uh, beyond persuasive interfaces. And this is all in the hope that I could potentially keep building this persuasive well being technology uh, future uh, of unobtrusive sensors and interventions for stress management. And that's uh, my talk. And thanks for your attention. And sorry for the small delay. Thanks again. Awesome. Let's uh, thank Pablo for a great talk. Claps, everyone else, your virtual claps. Uh, yeah, and we have uh, time for questions. Um, Pablo, very, very, very interesting talk. Thanks. Um, Hi, Jamie. How are you doing? Um, yeah, very good. So I just have a question um, and see if I characterize your work correctly. Right. Okay. So you are able to instrument everyday objects to characterize humans' behavior. And then responsively provide uh, micro uh, intervention or just in time intervention. Right. So I wonder if you look at this a bit longer term and then be able to identify um, predictive patterns uh, so that it's not just responsive to people's uh, stress behavior, but you actually anticipate um, potentially um, problematic behaviors. Yeah. And then, so that's one. And in, re in relation to this, how do you bring context into? Um, support this because I think right now it's mostly um, behavioral sensing yeah. and I feel like um, mm -hmm. there might be a lot in the context surrounding people's behavior so I'm just yeah. curious about your thoughts on this yeah thanks for that question so yeah indeed my work has been mostly on this let's say public health domain I work with healthy people to keep them healthy essentially as opposed to like patients who go uh, issues. Uh, I'm actually teaming up with uh, a leading OCD uh, researcher here in psychiatry. Uh, very soon we're writing a grant on how do we use, for example, these passive sensors that we have to, to detect, in this case, anomalies in the movement, to detect these patterns of, for example, recursive like behaviors uh, online, the, the compulsions of OCD. Like, how do we detect compulsion, right? Uh, and that's actually something that we can certainly like, you know, do. And, and it's actually something that's very exciting. It's a different way of looking at the time series. It will have to be done on aggregate and longer terms as opposed to the micro analysis that we do. And it will basically lead to the, to the, to, to the opportunity there. I'm also talking with a neuro a neurologist who's very interested in like, what if this, uh, you know, the, the trajectory of these curves uh, that uh, represent, you know, how you move from point A to point B to click on a thing, over time becomes slower, for example. And that might be correlated with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, right? That small reduction in motor ability might be a you know, precursor in perhaps years in advance of like deterioration of your uh, motor abilities. So we're also discussing that in the realm of, of uh, neurology in that case. So at the end of the day, I think the harder question is the one that you're asking is like, well, how do you, get to really work in that realm, right? With patients and, and, and all the privacy preserving aspects and all that. So um, for, for us to really, uh, you know, study this, uh, this uh, uh, get to the level of, of being as, as private as possible, uh, it's actually very important that we continue to collect, you know, information about the users. Uh, I would say the closest that we, the uh, users that have, you know, this level of risk uh, and eventually learn how much data do I really need to collect? what kind of pictures do I really need to collect? Do I need to collect all the time or do I need to collect less data? What's the optimal amount of data in order to make the predictions that you're doing, right? And in order to do that, you will have to, I would say it's like, you know, back and forth type of question. Like, you know, you propose that we will collect less data based on like some kind of uh, privacy issues, but also you look at the data itself. So. The data that's coming from the doctors, I didn't mention that we're actually measuring doctors in the clinics right now. And we're basically collecting that data to do pre burnout prevention. It's actually starting to become very interesting to us because it shows that there is 
uh, you know, the possibility of collecting like, you know, less data than necessary. Um, the car, I actually showed an example in the car, you only uh, need like, you know, about eight turns to have like a stable reading of, uh, of stress. And even in the mouse stress paper, you know, with 10 samples, you could potentially already uh, read uh, the variation that you need for stress. It all depends at the end of the day of what you're measuring. A stress, you know, changes over minutes. Uh, uh, you know, a partisan changes over years uh, and uh, compulsions uh, are more an aggregate of all these measurements. So I think there is a huge potential to have more of this passive sensing and definitely an important question of how do we collect the right type of like, you know, data and the right type of consent. Of course, as I said, you know, we're going to be measuring for many years. We cannot just get one consent. We have to like make sure that people, we, uh, that, that the consent adapts to the longitudinal nature of measurement too. I don't know if that answered the question enough. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Pablo, for a, for a great talk. Uh, you've mentioned uh, a lot of problems with evaluating interventions, like you've mentioned uh, uh, bad compliance or non-adherence for wearables and things like that. And you've also mentioned what, what sounded like systematic dropout for, for, bandit, for your bandit stuff. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned those things and you've mentioned that they're a problem, but I haven't Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, quite gotten like how you actually address that stuff and then like post hoc and analysis. Uh, people who do clinical trials worry a lot about this kind of stuff, of course. Uh, and there are all these methods, like for example, for dropout, there is a, an extensive literature on instrumental variables to adjust for that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, similarly, there are things for systematic dropout. So I'm just curious how you thought about that. Yeah, the systematic dropout is certainly a very important uh, issue. If you look at, you know, some of the predicaments by by people who work in like specifically apps and digital medicine, like Eisenbach, he has a very, Eisenbach has a, this paper, the law of attrition. He basically says the problem with apps is that, you know, the low, the barrier of entry is so low that, you know, you get this tremendous uptake at the beginning. And then there's a natural, very huge uh, dropout at the beginning such uh, that you know if you want to apply traditional models like you know intention to treat and all these other type of models that assess long-term adherence they they break because of the tremendous uh, uptake so part of the challenge to do that is like first to understand the dynamics itself of like you know apps and how people will adapt to apps you know by knowing that there is maybe this uh, part at the beginning of the trial where you might have like people who are just using it out of curiosity and not really out of like true interest. But also uh, we have to basically start looking at how can we compound, for example, the, uh, the uh, novelty and, and the systematic uh, effects into the reward uh, system of, for example, bandits in this case, like can we actually compound, you know, the amount of like times that people like, you know, uh, access a, uh, a intervention into the reward system itself and see if we can optimize for that compounded uh, reward as opposed to optimize just for the immediate reward that we were uh, calculating, which in this case was stress management. So there is all these numerical techniques that, that need to be done. But, but the other component that I really want to bring into consideration is the, the human aspect of the, this kind of things. Like at the end of the day, some of this systematic uh, you know, dropout uh, was because of the perception of the system itself. They basically felt that the system was uh, stressful, right? That was the, one of the things that I mentioned, you know, on the stress the management app. And that perception of the system uh, generating a stress was really problematic because we wanted people to actually use it as a tool to reduce stress, not as a tool to make them stress. Um, so we've been investigating that by actually, like, you know, looking at linguistic uh, aspects of, you know, how to like introduce uh, the language of the types of things that you will do with these microinterventions. First of all, you, you will never call these things microinterventions at all. Like, I mean, it should be called something like, you know, activities or like goals, etc. Second of all, you don't frame it around stress. Also, we on the chatbots project, I mean, that's actually one of the things we, we basically said. It's like, you know, these chatbots are your companions to support, you know, your journey to be strong, you know. So you focus more on the positive aspect of this thing as opposed to the negative aspect. Because it's like uh, as simple as the traditional linguistic uh, proposition by, by Lekov, right? You cannot 
uh, not think of the elephant. So it's a composition of like the, the let's call it linguistic or, or marketing, even you want to call it, right? People would say it's a marketing component. Well, marketing plays an important role. Like, I mean, it, it's not a secondary role in the case of interventions, right? How you position this thing has an effect on how people perceive it. That combined with like, you know, modification in this reward shaping uh, part of the numerical aspects uh, could be one avenue to start like, you know, supporting longer term adherence uh, and trying to address some of these uh, systemic, um, that you call systemic dropout issues um, that we observe in our systems. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Maybe if I could just pop in on that. So one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about lately is um, different groups of people and how they're gonna react to this. So we've been talking a lot about older adults as well and how technology is gonna support them. Um, particularly you know, the generation of older adults that I represent that grew up with technology already. So we're kind of used to having technology in our lives. Um, and a lot of this comes down to individualization. You know, the idea that, you know, you were just saying when you put an app out, you get a huge uptake and a bunch of people drop out. Well, how much of that is related to the fact that, you know, different people are looking for different things in that app or have, you know, come to it with a different context. And if one could start to create uh, a space where, uh, where they're able to essentially adapt to whatever that context is, you might actually get more stiction from uh, the users. Have you thought a lot about how you would you would develop individualization into these systems as opposed to just kind of, you've got an app and it goes out and does things? Well, there's there's several several things that you can do. I mean, um, at, at the end of the day, this, uh, for example, pop therapy paper that I showed, uh, I, I took the, the, the notion of, of, of personalization at the, at the granularity of the, of the intervention type, right? So you say, instead of having one, one intervention, you have a suite of interventions, right? So now if I have a suite of interventions, I can select the ones that work for different people. And maybe that didn't come clear enough. Like it wasn't like we converged towards like only possible. It was each person had different treatments. So essentially from the 16 interventions, each of the 19, 95 participants have different uh, preferred and, and top uh, interventions. The average was what I show you, yeah, you know, positive psychology and somatic seem to be an average, but essentially it was like different comments. So that's, that's at the level of the granularity of the intervention itself. I, I'm convinced that we have to work on ecosystems and suites of interventions as opposed to like finding one single intervention and, and, and operate with a meta layer of recommendation on top of these like suites of interventions, right? So it's such that you can learn from that. So that, that's one thing. The other one is like, let's say one level of uh, abstraction above, which is uh, how do you create like narratives that can tie all these uh, descriptions in a systemic way? Like how do we create a narrative that, you know, for example, ties all these interventions into like something larger than just managing a stress, right? And these narratives uh, have been studied recently, actually Lende, James Lende, my former advisor, published an interesting paper on like narratives for like uh, weight management. And I myself have taught a couple of classes on narratives for behavior change and all that, basically based on Dan McAdams uh, uh, work in uh, narrative therapy. And essentially it boils down to what are the things that are important to you. For example, if I can embed the different interventions into a narrative of me going up a mountain, for example, I'm from the Andes, right? From, from South America, it will have a, a deeper meaning to me. It will basically keep me engaged because I know how going up a mountain looks mm -hmm. like. There is this like approach that, for example, McGonigal, Jay McGonigal, the game designer uh, made is called Super Better that has a very interesting uh, you know, approach where she said, we're gonna create a game around behavior change. We're gonna assign different characters from different people around me, like different roles. And in her, in her case, she chose superheroes. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm the super woman. And then this guy is like, you know, Superman and she, he's gonna support. And that's great if you like superheroes. I, I don't re really care about superheroes. I care about like mountains. So one, one way to decompose that that I've been thinking is like, can we have the mechanics of the dramatic arc decompose separate from the metaphors and eventually start incorporating that, those two together? So we can always have the dramatic arc of going up or down or like recovery from, uh, from going down at some point and then continuing. And then add to that metaphors, like for example, the discussion of uh, the mountain or the other one. And I could easily change the bots that I have, for example, instead of calling them Sherlock bot, I can call him like, you know, the wise elder from like my, my, my town, right? It doesn't have to be called Sher Sherlock, right? 
And that little variation might already have an impact in me, the shaman instead of the Sherlock, right? He's the one who investigates things. So I think this is a, another op opportunity, uh, it's, and thanks for bringing that question where that I would like to investigate, is how to bring narratives um, you know, as a, as a glue to put together all this variation. And, and, and you know, I could keep, keep talking, but maybe I don't want to worry. On the lower level, you can also modify interventions, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can also take those like, you know, uh, micro interventions and, and, and featureize them in terms of like what kind of things you can change. For example, one thing that we did in the chatbot was some, sometimes the chatbot would say, hi, 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 sir, how are you doing? Uh, so, and sometimes it's like, what's up, dude? How are you doing today? Right, that change is the same greeting. I mean, it's, you're greeting the person, but in two different ways. And just by changing that, that thing, we had tremendous differences, at least at the qualitative level. We observed that, you know, older generations, as you said, they, they didn't like this, like, why is this chat was being so fresh, right? Talking to me like that versus like younger people like, oh, dude, this is cool. Now I want to talk to the chat, right? <laughs> So anyways, at the end of the day, summarizing, there's micro, micro modifications that you can do at the level of interventions. You can also keep operating at the sweep level and also tie it all together with a narrative, the arc and metaphors that will get people more engaged depending on your age or gender or whatever preference that you want. Great, no, it's a wonderful answer, thank you. Thank you. So we're basically out of time, but maybe one more quick question if anyone has one. No. Okay, great. Let's uh, thank Pablo again. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, great. And I will stop recording. All right.